Okay. Seeing as everybody is here, uh, the technological miracle, um, why don't we get started? I'm Andrew Friedman. Um, my my claim to cannabis fame was that uh, in 2014, when uh, Colorado had legalized cannabis, uh, Governor then Governor Hickenlooper, now Senator Hickenlooper, uh, asked me to oversee the regulatory programs for adult use, medical use, and also the hemp programs in Colorado. Um, locally, I was the, the cannabis czar, and now work as the executive director for the Coalition for Cannabis Policy, Education, and Regulation, um, a, a group devoted to getting legalization right on the federal level. Um, I am joined today by two unbelievably well-credentialed individuals to talk uh, uh, through uh, removing barriers for housing, healthcare, and employment, the, the topic of today. Uh, I will have them introduce the, themselves. Let's start with Representative Rob. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm State Representative Chris Rabb, AKA Rep Rabb, and uh, I represent uh, uh, 63,000 souls in Northwest Philadelphia. This is my third term, and um, I'm a proud advocate for uh, sound uh, cannabis policy, and I'm also a, a medical cannabis user here in, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I, I, I hate to interrupt you. Is anybody else getting a... Okay, sorry, I was getting interference. I'm sorry, Chris, continue, sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying that in addition to being a legislator and an advocate um, on this issue, I'm also a medical cannabis patient myself. I'm so sorry to have interrupted. And Mr. Brisbo. Uh, Andrew Brisbo, I'm the executive director of the Marijuana Regulatory Agency in Michigan. So we are responsible for uh, the patient caregiver registry in the state as well as our commercial licensing programs for medical facilities and adult use establishments. And I'm also on the executive committee of CANRA, uh, which is the Cannabis Regulators Association, a, a national group of state regulators in the cannabis space. So uh, medical cannabis has been perhaps the strangest uh, political, scientific, uh, and populist phenomenon in uh, modern American democracy. Uh, uh, essentially uh, a call from a number of people, uh, a, a, a true grassroots movement uh, that started from the fact that cannabis was helping people legitimately uh, with uh, all sorts of ailments um, and a, uh, a reluctance, in, in fact, a complete intransigence from the federal government to continue to move research um, or, or science based on cannabis uh, forward and therefore a revolt from um, this growing population of people who wanted to see not only for themselves, but for their loved ones and for the community as the whole, cannabis available as a medicine. Uh, but that, so, and so as everybody here knows, um, that grew to 36 states having reformed their laws um, to allow for cannabis to be used as a medicine for their patients. Um, but that, that political mechanism, that, a way, that way of accomplishing their goal uh, has had some foreseen and unforeseen consequences um, and I think most uh, pertinent to it is um, all of the ways in which medicine is treated um, through uh, housing, employment, healthcare, um, for any other medicine is not the ways in which uh, uh, cannabis as a medicine on a state level uh, can be treated. Um, and so our panelists today are going to talk through both on the state level what can be done with that, uh, along with uh, what should be the next steps uh, on, the, on the federal level. Uh, I think that the growing sentiment amongst a number of cannabis, uh, medical cannabis users and ones that I heard at home uh, when I was working for Colorado and, and continue to hear um, is that they're tired of being treated like second class citizens uh, when it comes to medical cannabis use. So uh, the first question for both of you, um, and and uh, maybe starting off uh, with Director Brisbo, um, I'm curious to know your thoughts um, Regarding outstanding policy issues in state medical programs, what efforts are your states making to address the sort of issues outlined? Well, I think as we see a shifting public sentiment, and, and I think legalization for adult use in Michigan had an interesting impact where it, it led to some uh, level of destigmatiz destigmatization of medicinal use, almost like a, a, it improved public perception and political perception of the use of is we're trying to close the gap is to allow telemedicine to be used for, for patient certifications. We had an executive order that allowed that in Michigan during the pandemic that was 
uh, overturned by our Supreme Court. So, so cannabis patients who want to get uh, physician certification for medicinal use are essentially it's the only mechanism, the only medicinal uh, patient doctor uh, interaction that cannot be done through telemedicine in Michigan right now. So we're, we're trying to, to fix that. Uh, but overall, in Michigan, the laws were written in such a way that the protections, if you will, when we look at things like housing and employment, uh, are on the side of employers still being able to have zero tolerance policies, uh, even for medicinal use, uh, for landlords to still uh, prohibit uh, the, the use of cannabis, even for medicinal purposes and certain, through certain mechanisms within rental properties. And for example, I, this, this comes up all the time, the sort of uh, hypocrisy, if you will, that that staff at my agency where we issue cards and oversee the program cannot be medicinal users, users of cannabis because we are a zero tolerance employer uh, in, in state government. So th those are things that I think the, the policy needs to evolve to, to, to truly look at cannabis from uh, you know, a, a medical perspective. Oh, You're yeah. muted, Andrew. <laughs> Rep Rab, which I'll never get wrong again. As a, as a, uh, um, uh, a policymaker and a patient yourself, um, where would, where do you see this going? Oh goodness. Well, I, I, <laughs> so it's, it's funny and, and ironic and problematic, uh, about what you were saying before, Andrew, that, you know, the, the staff can't actually <laughs> like the zero tolerance policy prohibits them from participating. Right. Um, Correct. So there's 300,000 medical cannabis users. I'm not going to say patients because you cannot be prescribed medical cannabis in our Commonwealth. So even though it says a patient card, that's misleading. I cannot get a prescription. And my, uh, my internist doesn't know anything about cannabis and is not really a fan, but the law requires her as a certified um, provi uh, not provider, uh, health uh, physician, she she's allowed to fill out the paperwork to allow me to do it, even though she gives me no information and is not actually supportive of it. <laughs> so I have to go to I, I can go to another doctor who can certify me over the phone. Um, but if I want advice, that's not part of the process. If I want to as a patient. I'm, there's a disconnect there. I have to go see the pharmacist at the dispensary I go to because every dispensary in Pennsylvania has to have a full-time pharmacist. So the pharmacist on site is the best person I can get for this type of thing. If I don't know any physicians um, or there are none in network, if I don't have health insurance, who can actually talk to me about how cannabis could help me? I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, and so, and I am rather connected. <laughs> I'm a middle class state legislator. He speaks English as a first language with good health care. Uh, and I feel like it, it's hard to process myself. And a lot of this is politics. So because I'm the state legislator, I can say this. Um, the policy is corrupted by um, politicians. And I make that to make that distinction between public servants. Right. If you're doing this for if you're following the science, if you're doing this for public health, if you're doing this for personal choice, you're doing this to have an informed, evidence based kind of uh, approach to how this could help and provide options for folks. Then we need to remove a lot of these barriers and reduce the bureaucracy and have meaningful conversations to improve these laws and expand them to adult use cannabis. Um, but right now, the the program is is deeply flawed and also it's not affordable right At, again i'm middle class and it's expensive and i represent working class and poor folk and if they do everything right and jump through all these hoops they get to buy medical cannabis that they can barely afford um and you know i have three hundred thousand fellow pennsylvanians who have medical cannabis cards um who just because they ingest it weeks prior could get pulled over and get a, a cannabis related DUI, which is deeply problematic. And most of the folks, I believe, I don't know for certain, but I believe are probably middle class senior citizens. So as you, as you, I mean, you, you, um, there's almost a, a parade of horribles there, uh, Representative. Um, as you look at that parade, where, 
where are you looking to kind of start? Or maybe, you know, where should, uh, at the state level, efforts from people who may be watching today's webinar or other people from ASA, um, where should they start digging in first in order to kind of figure out how best to, to square this round peg around the square peg or, or however the saying goes? I have a crystal ball. It's invisible. It's right here. This crystal ball is looking into the future to say how we can pass laws to um, um, make cannabis policy more humane, more accessible, um, all of those things. And in this crystal ball, um, the, the fulcrum will be when people who are in the majority who, who run Harrisburg, our state capital, uh, which presently are Republicans in both the House and the Senate, when one or more of their family members gets pulled over for a DUI, even though they weren't imp impaired, or one of their loved ones will be fired for, for admitting that they use medical cannabis in a zero tolerance workplace, or they're a tenant and they're not allowed to, uh, to, to use legally because the, the landlord says, uh-uh-uh, or a family or person, or maybe a, a big donor is trying to put up a medical cannabis uh, uh, dispensary and the, uh, the property owner says, no, we have a policy, no cannabis. And that brings in a lot of money. These are very you know, profitable entities. And once it hits them at home in their district with a major donor, there are no campaign finance caps in Pennsylvania. So that could be a really big donor. <laughs> when it happens to someone who's in their midst, it'll be a priority. And that's very cynical, but that's what my crystal ball says. And we've seen that in other issues like LGBTQ issues. When you, when you discriminate against my daughter, oh, well then that's an issue, right? But if it's somebody else's from a bad neighborhood, it's not an issue, but you mess with my daughter, oh, well, then we got to change the laws. And I, yeah. practically speaking, that's what's going to happen. Uh, almost a, 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 almost a, a positive outcome of in your backyard. Yep. Um, and, and Mr. Brisbo, um, I'm going to call you Andrew. Andrew, um, uh, from the regulator's standpoint and, and, and kind of a, the regulatory way of, of progressing policy through, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about this organization, uh, the Cannabis Regulators uh, Association or CANRA, um, uh, both what it is and, and how you might see uh, a group like this interacting with CANRA and, and what kind of outcomes they should be looking for uh, to influence state policy. Sure. I, I think our group is is uh, it, it, it's unique in its in its construction, and as we uh, are a group of state regulators who have done something and in a way that that uh, there was no 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 basis and knowledge to figure out how to do. Uh, and, and you had experience with this, Andrew, doing it in Colorado. Like so, so the only people we had to learn from as states started to progress was each other. And so I think formalizing this group really helps to advance state level policies in states that are coming on board now because they have us as a resource to say, we've been there, we've done that, here's what worked, here's what didn't. Uh, and it's very easy, you know, if I could steal uh, Rep. Rab's crystal ball, like we know what's gonna happen in your state because it happened here. It's always the same progression of issues, but as new states come on board, they go through that progression much more quickly than states that, that are more mature come on board. So being that resource to other states, I think gives them an opportunity to approach state level policy with a better base of knowledge as to how to go about it than if you were trying to do it in a vacuum. And I think our organization is, is open to collaboration with, with anyone that, that could be viewed as a stakeholder in uh, state level policy or particularly national policy. And, and one of the things that we do talk about, you know, there are a few hot button issues that are always up there. We talk social equity, we talk sustainability. And a lot of what we talk about as well is, is patient access in a growing adult use market. How do you ensure that those who are you know focused on medicinal cannabis use what are the how, how do you ensure they still have access as we see that shift uh what else can be done you know that's tangentially related things like opening up opportunities for research and easing some of the dea restrictions on where product can be sourced for research purposes how we open up uh it's something i'm keenly interested in in michigan how do we open up pathways for colleges and universities that want to have degree programs and you know how can we train uh, those who are in health related sectors, uh, nurses and doctors to have cannabis as part of their curriculum so that they have a better understanding, feel more comfortable in that role as, as, as Rep. Rab alluded to so that, so that they can give guidance to their patients on, on what to do. We have a similar approach in Michigan right now where our physician certification is 
uh, an acknowledgement that a patient has a qualifying condition, but then you're on your own. You know, figure it out. Yes, you can you can have the card to use medicinal cannabis that prevents you from being arrested or prosecuted, but does not give you any uh, guidance that you would normally expect from your health practitioner as to what products to use, how much, when, and why to treat the condition for which you're seeking uh, cannabis as a you know therapeutic remedy. So true. I think I think what you guys are doing um, uh, over at Canra. Um, may end up being kind of the biggest source of change over the coming years. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement on the federal level, but we all know the federal government um, can act at a glacial plate pace. Um, I, I'm going to ask first, uh, Rep, Rep. Rab, whether we know Pencil if Pennsylvania is planning on getting involved in Canada. But before I do, uh, we are three minutes away from Q&A. So please, please leave questions that you have for this group um, uh, so that we can dive in. Um, so a, a two-part question for you. Um, uh, Rep. Rab, um, first, uh, do you think that you guys will be involved in, in the Canada organization going forward? And, and second, uh, on the federal level, I know that um, there are calls, especially from, from groups like ASA, for changes to screenings, uh, for, for housing, to um, uh, tenant, uh, tenant law requirements. Um, uh, where do you think both for, to a Canra and to the federal government, the first asks should be about how policy should change. That is um, <laughs> that is a great question, and I guess I should I should push back and say, who is the we? Are we referring to the executive branch? Are we talking about uh, or or the legislative branch? Or uh, you know, I'm on four standing committees: finance, commerce judiciary and agriculture, and they all relate to cannabis policy in very different and complementary ways, and none of them are dealing with them substantively. And there's not a real political will collectively to address this um, in ways that um, are meaningful because I think folks punted and say, okay, we're gonna do medical cannabis, but we're gonna leave it alone because anything else would be too radical. We, there's not the political appetite um, for the people in power to do any of this at present. But like I said, it's probably gonna be folks back home who say, listen, I'm a conservative and I support cannabis. And that's probably is gonna be the tipping point where it transcends political ideology. Cause right now it appears to be more partisan than it really is. And it's not, there, there are people all across the political spectrum who want to have this choice and to make uh, decisions as consenting adults. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what the um, what the tip of the spear will be for us in Pennsylvania, but I do know that grassroots mobilizing works and people need to be informed and we should give people the benefit of the doubt if they've never had this conversation, if they've never thought about issues regarding, uh, you know, uh, residency, uh, DUIs, all of these things that are impacting folks in rural, urban and suburban areas across the state that they're gonna to have to think about those things. Um, and organizations um, like Americans for Safe Access and others can really play an important role in this. Andrew, same, same question to you on, on the federal government side. Um, where do you think um, groups like ASA should be looking for change? Where would you be looking for change um, uh, for the federal government, for the administration or, or for the legislature? Well, you know, depending on how policy reform is approached at the federal level. I, I, you know, will it happen in some big holistic sweep of decriminalization, legalization, or is it going to happen in, in pieces? And I, I would guess it probably more happens in, in pieces. And I think if there are some targeted areas uh, that, that I think are most important, it is opening up the doors for more robust research, freeing up, freeing up dollars for research that are provided by the federal government, freeing up uh, state legalized programs to provide researchers with the cannabis that's actually used in both the medicinal and adult use markets for the purposes of that research. And I think in the education sector as well, that there could be something analogous to the Cole memo for colleges and universities, uh, an agreement of no action by the Department of Education. So these schools can offer degree programs, uh, can support their students without losing uh, federal student aid. Uh, and giving them more flexibility to build it into their programs. So th those are a couple of areas that I think would, would really help uh, you know, free things up and, and normalize things at, at the state level. And then overall, when it comes to federal policy, I, I think, you know, from our organization's standpoint, we want to be at the table, have that state regulator approach, help the feds learn from what we already know, having done it, and not try and do a federal takeover. 
Um, you know, let state markets that are working continue to work, but provide some of that federal infrastructure for the support of these programs already. You know, the feds have infrastructure that we need to leverage when it comes to standards for, for testing and, and, you know, research dollars and, and the like, and standardization for those critical public health uh, issues that we all face in this, on a state-by-state -state basis. We have some, some great questions from the audience that we want to move to right now. Um, how has the phasing of caregiver products at dispensaries affected the overall supply of cannabis products in Michigan? And I would imagine that's for you, Executive Director. Yeah. Uh, so so I, think, I think it phased in pretty well in that we saw a, a dramatic increase in supply that was produced in the regulated market as we required the phase out of the infusion of caregiver products into the regulated space. And that, that was an issue where we were stuck with sort of a chicken and egg situation and, and ultimately uh, signaled that we were going to phase that out. And we saw a dramatic increase in regulated production as a result of that. And, uh, you know, and I think to the benefit of consumers and, and patients in particular, that increase in supply has led to a significant decrease in, in price, which is good. So even over the last year, we've had a 22% decrease in the retail price of medical cannabis products and a 46% decrease in adult use cannabis products. So I think we're starting to see as the market matures more uh, stability within the market as well, particularly from a consumer perspective. You'd think we'd understand these mute buttons after a while. Uh, to rep Rab, uh, uh, one of the questioners uh, saw the story about uh, the Thomas Jefferson employee who was fired for testing positive while being a registered patient in Pennsylvania. I don't know if you've seen that story um, uh, and if you have any thoughts on it. Um, I haven't seen the story. The journalist reached out to me um, and I said, hey, uh, put that employee in touch with me. Um, uh, so if, if you could put that in, the, if you could put the link in there, I'd like to read the story. But I was approached um, and I, I think it's awful. And this is this is the bitter irony of the kind of puritanical nature of, of policy shaping on this issue. And it needs to be addressed um, in meaningful ways. And once we tell people stories about all the pernicious ways which um, people are doing everything right, are being punished in ways that are very deleterious to their professions, to their health, um, uh, and so on, I think we'll be able to chip away at the skepticism. And again, when it happens to someone you care about in your position of power, you're going to start to speak up. We've seen it time and time again. I believe that's what's going to happen. But I also want to say for the record, I want to introduce a bill that does what uh, the, the Cole memo for state universe, colleges and universities. That's brilliant. If someone has already done it, I will credit them and I will use that as model legislation in Pennsylvania. That is a great idea. And I'm glad I'm on this panel. If for no other reason than I have another bill. Go that has great value and substance. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, Michigan. <laughs> uh, last question, I think, unless we, uh, unless it wraps up, uh, unless this is a shorter answer than I expect, but how do we do away with drug-free zones such as hospitals, schools, and housing? <laughs> well, my, my short answer to that is we need to elect um, legislators who are not stuck in the 80s and 90s. How about that? Um, <laughs> and we, we consider um, and we actually look at the research to show what's worked and what hasn't. If you believe in feeding the prison industrial complex at the expense of what's best for public health and community safety, then double down on that. But if you actually care about what the facts show and you also consider the evolving cannabis policy ecology, then this is exactly something we need to talk about. But ultimately, you know, elections have consequences and we need to have the right proportion of folks on both sides of the aisle that will do the right thing um, because this is not doing what um, people claim it does. It's not keeping us safer. Um, it is putting people uh, in harm's risk um, who are doing everything that they're supposed to do, but because they're caught up um, in very kind of arcane um, uh, 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 criminal offenses and approaches to, to uh, the, the carceral system, this is what is produced. You're muted again, Andrew. We have such a, we have such a, uh, 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 just a few minutes left, but uh, it's a great last question um, from, from Debbie, Debbie Wimberly. 
how can a patient, a uh, cannabis patient and advocate make an impact with their state's MMJ program to ensure they are working for the patient? Uh, Let's start with you, executive director. Yeah, please, I want to hear this. Oh, come on, I'm, I'm not the politician here, but uh, <laughs> I, I think it, and this goes to the to the point where I was just making, because I thought in Michigan, we look at drug-free school zones as well, that, that one of the things that I think has been incredibly impactful is uh, advocating directly to legislators, and, and that can be a slog because there's there's so many of them, and change their perception of what's happening. I think many uh, policymakers, their their mind's eye uh, for what they view as you know patient access and commercialization uh, of a marijuana industry is, is not what it really is, and they need to to get into facilities, see grow operations, see provisioning centers and retailers, as we call them here in Michigan, talk to patients directly, and I don't think they're going to be proactive about that. Uh, there, there are very few policymakers I've dealt with where uh, cannabis is at the top of their policy agenda. Um, one of the hardest things that 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 we face when, we, when it comes to policy is getting the attention of legislators, especially now. Uh, you know, COVID is is number one on everyone's agenda, more than likely, and there are a million other policy issues that are brought to the doorstep of legislators every day. Uh, so you have to make a little noise. You have to get on their agenda. You have to talk to them about what their needs are. And as Rep. Rab alluded to, pulling back the curtain on how politics really works, right? You have to humanize it, and you have to let them know that this is impactful within their their jurisdiction, and it's going to, you know, it's going to be a positive influence when it comes to you know uh, getting votes and and developing good policy. I I agree wholeheartedly, and I want to add to that. There is a there is a right argument. Um, for everybody, you have to find what that is. You have to find that um, you got to reach people where they are. So I, I'm um, I'm working on a bill to uh, introduce the bill to repeal the death penalty. My approach is a racial justice approach. That's what, what brought me into this. But for another colleague who's helping me with this, who is a conservative, a ultra conservative, devout Catholic, it's about faith for him. These things can coexist. If you know what triggers that individual, good or bad, that's how you have to focus your advocacy as a citizen lobbyist. Everyone who's a part of this conference is a de facto citizen lobbyist. You have to do the due diligence to see who you need to talk to. And for me, a lot of this stuff will go through the Judiciary Committee, which means there's 25 of us who are on this committee, 10 Democrats, 15 Republicans. Figure out what is the, the linchpin for each of those folks uh, with stakeholders like me and other folks in your respective state and figure out what that uh, compelling argument is and keep at them, keep at them. And eventually uh, we can wear folks down who are not already on the right side of history. We are here at uh, a closing thought or two. I will give mine in that um, we, I started with the theme that there's been frustration that um, cannabis patients have been treated as, as second class citizens. Um, I will I will give the reverse of that, which is a, a positive note. I think more than ever, the wind is at the back for these grassroots movements to have a very real impact uh, on, on every level of government, local, state uh, and federal. Um, so um, uh, at least for my part, I, ha I, I think the, the payoff has been coming. The payoff is, has, has come in many ways. Uh, I know that it's not always uh, exactly where it needs to be. Um, but there's great progress and I think potential for even more great progress. Um, so uh, closing thoughts uh, in two seconds or less from, from, from both groups. Representative. Okay. Um, it's not a matter of um, if, it's just a matter of when and how. I'm more concerned that cannabis policy overall is just and humane and is based on science. And um, Whatever we're talking about, when we're talking about these seismic changes, um, we have to lo look at these things through an equity lens, no matter what. That should be the norm. That should be the default, not as an afterthought, as a set aside or something like that. It has to be baked into the very foundation of these very critical um, policies that impact every sphere of society. An executive director. I think I think you mentioned the right word, Andrew. Progress and and you know celebrate the, celebrate the progress and, and appreciate the progress that's being made. Um, uh, but fight against fight back against that sort of laissez-faire attitude that I hear a lot about now, where it's it's been legalized now. Just just go away. Uh, now that you have policy in place, it needs to continue to be refined uh, and and to focus on the issues that are most critical. But 
you know, uh, appreciate that progress is, is being made and, and maybe exercise a little bit of patience because these are challenging issues. But I, I think to your point, the tide is turning in terms of how, how sentiment is, is shifting uh, publicly and politically. I thank everybody for your time. I thought this was a great discussion.